Uh, I will just uh, kick things off very briefly to invite everyone uh, into the space for our next lecture in our 50th anniversary lecture series, which has provided us this year with opportunities to reflect on the last five decades of the field of architecture, as well as uh, our particular experiences here at UNC Charlotte, and also providing the obvious opportunity to think about the next 50 years and beyond. And uh, joining me in the space with our esteemed guest, Mario Carpo, are uh, Katty Zhang and Peter Wong, who are the curators and, and coordinators of this year's lecture series. Uh, and Katty will introduce Mario uh, and also Professor Lydia Klein, who has invited her students into the space for what we're now calling a focus group <laughs> following uh, Mario's lecture. So um, I've been looking forward to, to and I, I'll mention briefly, uh, Mario, that uh, your book, The Second Digital Turn, has been used uh, by the school uh, as an award, uh, as a gift to, to hand out to students in the past. Uh, so I've seen, you, I've seen copies of your book. I've been in, you know, selecting students to give your book to in the past. So it's kind of a regular uh, component of our library. So uh, when, I'm looking... when I am on campus, <laughs> I, I must sign each one of these copies. Oh, I like that. That's a good, we'll have to, yes, we'll have to in, in, actually ha host you in person at some point to do that. But you can sign uh, with an autograph. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'm, I've been looking forward to this for a long time and I will uh, hand things off to Caddy for the introduction. Thank you. All right, thanks, Bling. And um, thanks everyone. Welcome to um, today's lecture. It's a real honor for me to introduce today's speaker, Mario Carpo, internationally renowned and one of the most influential architectural historians and theorists today. He's the Rainer Bangham Professor of Architectural History and Theory at the Bartlett University College of London. He has taught internationally at many institutions, including the University of Geneva, the University of Florence, the University of Copenhagen, Cornell University, the MIT, Yale and Williams College. He was a scholar in residence at the Getty Research Institute in 2000 and 2001, a resident at the American Academy in Rome in 2004, and a scholar in residence at the National Gallery of Art in 2014. He was the head of the study center at the Canadian Center for Architecture between 2002 and 2006. Dr. Carpo has researched and published extensively on architectural theory cultural history, and the history of media and information technology. He's the author of Architecture in the, in the Age of Printing in 2001, The Alphabet and the Algorithm in 2011, and The Second Digital Turn, Design Beyond Intelligence in 2017, among other books. His essays and articles have been published in the log, Gray Room, Architectural Design, Perspectra, um, Harvard Design Magazine, Domus, art forum, and so on. Through lenses of architecture and digital technology, Dr. Carpo theorizes discreteness, chunkiness, robotic brutalism, mass collaboration, automation, mediated re representation, socially oriented computing, and et cetera, that connect history of architecture and emerging issues of the present times. He set, his writing sets stages for synthesizing beauty techniques, value, and intelligence. His most recent work, which we might learn more in his talk today, re-theorizes robotic manufacturing in the context of the pandemic and critically envisions the post-pandemic potentials of leaping forward with new design quests and technological uh, development. Please join me in welcoming Mario Carpo. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, for the introduction. Thank you, Blaine and team for the invitation. And so without further ado, let me move to my prepared paper. As I mentioned, I may run out of voice at some point while I read my paper. In that case, I will just drink a glass of water and restart after a brief intermission. But so let's, 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 let's start with my first protagonist of the day. It was a long time ago when Marshall McLuhan famously claimed that the medium is the message. 
That was 1964. And McLuhan was referring to the new global village of electronic communication brought about by radio and television. The medium is the message was originally the title of a chapter in a big scholarly book titled Understanding Media. Then McLuhan realized that the best way to explain TV was to go on TV, as you see, um, and they kept doing that very well for many years. But let's take McLuhan statement at face value and try to apply it outside of its original context. What's our medium today? Or rather, what has been our main medium for the last two years? I am a teacher and you may easily guess the main tool of my trade for the last two years has been Zoom, as indeed it is today. So if that is the medium, what is the message? Well, there is an immediate message evidently when we are on Zoom, we are meeting somehow, but we are not really together. We are not at school. In one of the two schools uh, where I teach, for example, one of the two schools where I teach has been almost entirely closed for 18 months. And after a number of partial reopenings followed by new shutdowns, many lectures are still online to this very day. Besides, even if our respective schools had been open for most of 2020 and 2021, I could not have come to your school, for example, because travel from Europe to the United States was forbidden from March 2020 to November 2021. And to this date, even when, when legal, international travel is still difficult, heavily regulated, and often more expensive than it used to be because fewer planes are traveling. Which suggests that alongside the immediate message I mentioned, there may be a more general but hidden message at play here. As we know, the global travel and transportation infrastructure of a modern industrial world all of a sudden came to a grinding halt in March 2020, when it just shut down entirely for some months, then restarting partially and intermittently following the ebb and flow of the pandemic. With travel and transportation suspended, the entire technical logic of the modern industrial machine made environment simply imploded. This is what many today call the Anthropocene meaning the modern mechanical world issued from the industrial revolution and based on standardized mass production, global mechanical transportation and the unlimited burning of fossil fuel. What we have seen for the last two years is simply the collapse of that world, the collapse of the Anthropocene. We all thought that the Anthropocene would come to an end little by little and over time due to global warming and climate change. Instead, the end of the Anthropocene came not by way of global warming, but of global infection, not due to climate change, but due to viral change. And it came suddenly, the space of a fortnight in March 2020. The speed and timing and nature of the catastrophe were of course unprecedented. Yet for us in the design professions, the end of the Anthropocene by itself should not have come as a surprise. After all, we had long been claiming that the technical logic of industrial modernity was obsolete and it was due to be replaced by the technical logic of post-industrial electronic computation. In particular, we had long been claiming that the electronic transmission of information is faster, cheaper, smarter, and more environmentally sustainable than the mechanical transportation of people and goods. And likewise, we had long been claiming that the distributed, automated, and digitally mass customized fabrication of physical goods is faster, cheaper, smarter, and more environmentally sustainable than the stand, than standardized industrial mass production. 
the global catastrophe of the pandemic has tragically vindicated many of these long held assumptions. Let's take a practical example to keep to our daily experience for the last two years. Let's, uh, let's look at the way we, the pandemic has changed higher education. Let's review briefly the way we have been teaching and studying since COVID came in March 2020 and our schools had to shut down. You will not be surprised to learn that being a teacher, one weekend in March 2020, without forewarning and all of a sudden, I had to transfer all my classes, lectures, tutorials, seminars from real classes to virtual ones, trying to figure out what we can and cannot do in this new electronic format. As all the media, the media we use inevitably feedback on the kind of messages we can convey, this is, as I'm certain we all know at this point, a complicated matter. Oh, where is my slide? Hold on. What you see on the screen, well, Peter Eisman, that's one, one of my first seminars online, March 2020. And Peter Eisenman, he's on the screen, then aged 88, he's now 90. He started teaching online on that day, just like that, as if he had been doing that all his life. And the, the same for Kurt Foster, you see him third on almost the same age. I don't know how they have been trained in secret because on that day when they had to start teaching on Zoom, they did it perf with a perfect naturality as if, you know, this is what they've been doing for 60 years. But for me, it was a different story. It was a steep learning curve because I had no experience of remote teaching. I had never done it before. So I had plenty of catching up to do technically and intellectually. But this is where I had to stop and ask myself, why on earth did I, did I not at least try to start and practice some remote teaching a bit earlier? Why did I wait so long? Why did I not start long ago? All the technology we use today to teach remotely, as we are doing today, has been widely available at least on campuses, since the mid 90s. And many daring experiments of e-learning and virtual classes were tested and tried back then in the 90s when the technology was new and promising and exciting. And many thought it could change teaching forever and for the better. I think, for example, of the early work of Mark Taylor, the Derrida scholar, professor of religion and philosophy, now at Columbia, then at Williams College. What you see on the right is the table of content of a book he published in 1994, Imagologist, that's the syllabus of a class, a virtual class taught in 1993-94, simultaneously at Williams in rural Massachusetts and in Helsinki, between people who had never met in person. And yet, that was 1993. And yet, in spite of such an early and promising start, e-teaching never really caught on. Even in more recent time, the rise of MOOCs, massive open online courses, has been widely dismissed. And it has been often disparaged by the global academic establishment, as well as seen with suspicion by activists of all ilk. But then if we stop again and step back and have a look at the bigger picture, it becomes evident that this pattern I just described is sequencing two steps. First, a period of great technological optimism in the 90s, followed by a deep distrust of digital technologies as of the early 2000s. This pattern of rise and fall in the appeal of digital technologies is part to a larger, more general trend. 
And this is a trend that we in the design professions are quite familiar with because this is a story that was at least in part of our own making. What you see on the screen is the uh, uh, table of content of AD folding in architecture, 1993, guest edited by Greg Lynn. For better or worse, starting from the early 90s, we, the design professions, we have been among the inventors, the protagonists, the pioneers of the digital term. We have embraced and adopted digital tools for notation, design, calculation, and fabrication sooner than many other trades and professions. And in the process, we have come up, we came up with ideas that have shaped our general understanding of digital technologies and of digital culture at large. The story of the invention of a digital turn in architecture in the 90s is well known. Back then in the 90s, designers and architects were the first to understand the revolutionary potential of seamless CAD-CAM integration, the continuity between digital design and digital fabrication. That new technical logic promised the mass production of variations at no extra cost. And some of us around that time came up with a new conceptual framework, well, a new theory to define this new technical object, to come to terms with this new way of making, which we now call digital mass customization or non standard seriality. At the same time, early 90s, new parametric software, as the first release of this one, um, for the design of complex geometrical shapes and streamlined surfaces in particular, created a new generation of architectural objects, which around that time, Greg Lean started calling blobs, uh, taking the inspiration from this old movie. Blobs have since taken over the world and they are still thriving. They are not called blobs anymore. Today, following Patrick Schumacher, many call this parametricism, but that's irrelevant because blobs come and go, after all, but just an architectural style, whereas the real revolution was, and still is, the technical logic of digital design and fabrication underpinning them. Regardless of form and style, this was a technical revolution with potential to change the way we design and make, produce and consume, buy and sell almost everything. Digital mass customization promises a new mode of design and fabrication that is unaffected by economies of scale. A new way of making, where making one or one million identical copies of the same item will come at the same unit cost. Where making one million items all the same or making all of them all different will always cost the same. And this doesn't depend on the shape. Greg Lean made curvilinear streamlined blobs. This is Bernard Cash a few years later. Bernard favored angular sharp shapes like these ones, but the technology underpinning the curvy blobs of Greg Lynn and the angular tables of Bernard Cash was the same, digital mass customization, digital parametricism. This was simply the industrial revolution in reverse, the reverse of all the principle of industrial mass production, of all the economics of modern industrial modernity. Architects and designers in the 90s were the first to intuit this, to come up with a theory, to describe and explain it. And if this were not enough, parallel to this story, which is all about CAD-CAM, digital tectonics, notation and fabrication, was another story unfolding at the same time, deeply intertwined with it, often told by the same protagonist often in the same schools and venues. In 1995, Bill Mitchell, then the Dean of Architecture and Planning at the MIT, published this seminal little book where he argued that many things we do, economic activities and social activities alike, 
would soon migrate from physical space to a new electronic space called the internet. And as a result, many building types that define the modern city would soon be made obsolete. In 1995, Mitchell made a list of functions and buildings slated to disappear. Bank branches to be replaced by electronic bank banking. Travel agents, because travelers would soon buy tickets from airlines website. Newspaper kiosks, because people would start reading newspapers online. Post offices, because people would start using email. Record stores and bookstores, because we would buy records and books online and then uh, possibly download them as digital files. Libraries, because we would check catalogs and soon read digitized books remotely instead of having to go on site. And last but not least, office buildings, because at some point, thanks to the internet, we would work from home without having to commute to an office anymore. The internet, that was the place where all these functions in most of our life was soon meant to be taken, taking place. Remember, that was 1995, when the internet was quite a new thing. And most of us didn't even have an internet access. And many were only just starting to learn the rules of the game as these two famous dogs practicing um, their presence on the internet in 1994 or 95. Now the internet itself was not new in 1995 as it derived from an older military network called the ARPANET. But in 1989 and 90, Tim Berners-Lee then working in Geneva, invented the HTTP, the HTML, hence the World Wide Web in this paper dated March 1989, originally a working paper of the European Center for Research on Atomic Power called the CERN, CERN. The World Wide Web, which gave every user the, of the internet the possibility to surf the web, the possibility to navigate the entire internet from one hyperlink to the next without having to type in a new internet address for each connection to a different server, which is what we had to do before the age of, um, um, of the web. But with the WWW, the World Wide Web, the internet suddenly became a user-friendly space ready for popular use, prime for commercial exploitation. Many started to think that the internet could be the future of retail. Amazon sold its first book on the internet in the summer of 1995. And the company was not called Amazon. It was called, as it still is, amazon.com. From the start, the name of the company was its internet address or more precisely, its URL, its address on the World Wide Web. And these are a few taglines that I remember from that distant time. From black and white to bits and bytes, that refer to the transition from print to electronic media. From brick and mortar to virtual reality, yes, the term virtual reality was already largely in use in the early 90s. And this one from a noted digital media pundit of the time, for every megabyte of memory you install on your hard disk, one square foot of retail space downtown will disappear. Strange as it may seem today, back then everyone thought that was a splendid idea. And around that time, some also started to point out that a reduction in the mechanical transportation of persons and goods could be environmentally friendly, or as we would say today, would reduce our carbon footprint, an expression that in 1995 did not exist. Bill Mitchell didn't even stop there. As an architect and urban theorist, he pointed out that the rise of the internet meant simply the end of the modernist city, the city of industrial modernity, based on the separation of functions, on the concentration 
functioning specialized zones. Uh, part of the city where we live, but we do not work. Not a part of the city where we work, but we do not live. Not part of the city where we shop, we go to the movie, and we have fun, but we do not live and we do not work there. So permanently commuting by car mostly from one place to the next. That was the Corbusier dream of the 20s. This, Mitchell argued, was over. With the shift from mechanical transportation to electronic transmission, many of these activities could be transacted anywhere because they would mostly take place on the internet. Hence, the functional segregation of modernist cities could stop. Cities could go back to being, to being integrated, organic, multifunctional, multi-purposes, and messy, as they had always been before the rise of modern urbanism. And then, most likely, many of these dispersed, distributed, despecialized activities would merge at some point to consolidate in a new, reconfigured, electronically connected physical place, the dwelling, the new domestic space, home. No longer at home, but at home. See how he wrote it. It's worth reading this quotation from Mitchell book of 1995, printed in 1995. It was likely written in 1993 or 1994. Given a choice, Many of us prefer working with a net at home. The domestic living room is emerging as a major site at which digitally displaced activities are recombining and regrounding themselves in the physical world. That was 1995. Where have we been for most of the last two years? After working from home nonstop for most of the last two years, we can certainly see some of the downsides of teleworking. Yet 25 years ago, everyone thought that the specialization, namely the migration of human activities from physical space to cyberspace, as we said at the time, many folk in 1995, that was the future. And that future seen from 1995 looked good. Architects in Cyberspace, where were two or three issues of AD in the late 90s published with the same title, Cyberspace 1, Cyberspace 2, Cyberspace 3. The term cyberspace was invented by William Gibson, um, science fiction writer in 1984, partly derived from Venus Cybernetics, 1948, where cybernetics originally meant automatic piloting. Uh, it's a long story. In the 90s, cyberspace basically meant the internet, seen as an electronic alternative to physical space. But Gibson's original idea from that book of 1984 was based on electronic avatars. Hence, it was way closer to what today we call the metaverse. Metaverse, a new term, but the idea has been around for quite a long time in science fiction, at least since 1984. Back to 1990, digital intelligent designers, the digital avant-garde of the time, they were not the only ones to jump into cyberspace. It was a general leap of faith, a sudden surge of unrestrained enthusiasm for the redemptive power of the internet and of digital technologies in general. The digital revolution was then seen as the final fix for almost every problem created by the industrial revolution. If he had lived to see it, Karl Marx would have said that the digital age was the inevitable overcoming of the industrial age. Now, of course, nobody was reading Karl Marx in 1995. Instead, everyone was buying internet companies on the stock exchange. That was the beginning of what we call today the internet bubble. The valuation of all dot-com companies, companies with a dot and a com in their name, in plain they were doing business on the internet, just suggesting they would at some point, this valuation surged. Between 1995 and um, March 2000, 
the NASDAQ composite index. Can you see the last part of the graph? Because on my screen, it is covered by, the, um, by our own faces. But if you don't see it, you see that this line climbing and then it spikes because in the last segment, it goes up to 5,000. Um, so in the last two years, the valuation of the NASDAQ soared by 600%. This is the part of the graph that likely you cannot see, but you can imagine it. And as the chairman of the Federal Reserve of the United States, Alan Greenspan famously said back then, that was not due to, I quote, irrational exuberance, end quote. Valuations were soaring because the internet made our work in general more productive and many things easier to find, buy or sell, hence cheaper. Thanks to the internet, we were told we were all doing more with less, more work, more reading, more teaching, more learning, more researching, more interacting, more dating, you name it. These newfound riches in the years after the fall of the Berlin Wall were often called the dividends of peace. But the meteoric rise of the valuation of the dot-com companies of the time could equally have been called the dividends of despecialization. The bottom line is cyberspace costs less than physical space, and often it works better. Therefore, when the economy in general moves from physical space to cyberspace to the internet, we all become wealthier. Uh, that seemed too good to be true until it wasn't. The Nasdaq peaked on March 10, 2000. It lost, oops, uh, where is the new diagram? Well, it's probably still invisible. If you don't see the diagram, believe my word, it lost 80% of its value in the 18 months that followed. That was the dot crash in the burst of the internet bubble. Many tech companies disappeared. Amazon itself, for example, barely survived after losing 88% of its market capitalization. The Nasdaq took 15 years to crawl back to its value of March 2000, which only happened in April 2015. Stock exchange crashes tend to coincide with deep and sudden changes in culture and in society at large. The dot-com crash of year 2000 was no exception. As the Nasdaq plunged in 2000 and 2001, the general mood shifted suddenly for, from techno-friendly to technophobic. In the contrite climate of those post-crash years, which were also the post-9-11 years, Few still saw the internet as a benevolent or even as a promising technology. The anti-internet backlash was swift and predictable. As many had warned from the start, technology should not replace human contact. There can be no community without physical proximity. For Christian phenomenologists, and there are always many of them in the design professions, the elision of human dialogue started with the invention of alphabetic writing. If we write, we use a technology, the alphabet, to transmit our voice to others in our absence, in the absence of our body. That was the original sense of all media technologies. After that, things could only get from bad to worse. The internet was just more of the same. And the backlash continued, in a sense, to this day. A few years into the new millennium, the so-called social media reinvented the internet. In recent times, we have learned to fear their intrusion on our privacy. And moreover, by abolishing all traditional tools for moderation and giving unmediated voice to many dissenters and outliers, the internet is seen by many as the primary technical cause of the rise of populism. And that may, may as well be true, even though I suspect that if I had been a Roman Catholic cleric around 1540, 
I would have said the same of the use of the new barbaric technology of print by the like of John Calvin, Jean Calvin, or Martin Luther. I drafted a first shorter version of this paper in the spring of year 2000, which is now almost two years ago, during the first British lockdown, while self-isolating in my London apartment, like hundreds of millions of Europeans contemplating the unfolding of an unspeakable man-made catastrophe. From my living room windows, I used to see in normal times the distant cloak of airplanes gliding into Heathrow, evenly spaced, three minutes from each other. For most of 2020 and 2021, I could only see a handful, most of them carrying cargo, not passengers. Only a few months before the pandemic, Greta Thunberg, if you remember her, still incited us by words and deeds to flight shaming, meaning to shame those flying due to carbon footprint, due to the carbon footprint of air travel, which is why she traveled to New York to give a talk to the United Nations using a sailing boat. Um, she can rest now. She has won a battle big way, even though not for any reason she could have anticipated, as it appears that as the carbon heavy economy of the industrial age the Anthropocene collapsed in 2020, and in most of the world has not yet gone back to its pre-pandemic levels, or it may just be getting even, we may already significantly delay the timeline of global warming. Only a few months before the pandemic, some climate activists were more or less openly advocating the elimination of part of the human population as the only way to save the planet. Well, there you go, that's done. Meanwhile, something we have already learned from this catastrophe is that real viruses can be more lethal than internet viruses. The coronavirus didn't spread on the internet. It traveled by plane, boat, and rail. The coronavirus was born and bred as a pure product of the industrial mechanical age. If a few months back, when this all started, we had already been using more internet and flying less, as we are doing now by necessity, not by choice, many lives could have been saved because the virus would have had fewer conduits for spreading. So perhaps in retrospect, this is exactly what we should have been doing what we should have started doing long ago. Schools, stores, and factories have now reopened somehow, but many offices have not, for example. Many of us are still working from home and often shopping from home. And this is happening because the pandemic has demonstrated that the traditional way of working, the anthropocenic way of working, based on presence in the flesh, travel and transportation is no longer our only option. When we were obliged to work from home, we did. We did because we had to, but also because today's technology allows us to do so. During the pandemic, we have learned that today's electronic communication can already effectively replace plenty of face time, thus making plenty of human travel unnecessary. The alternative to air travel is not sailing boat travel, it's Zoom. If you know Greta Thunberg, tell her before she travels across the Atlantic once by sailing boat. And some even claim that the alternative may soon be the metaverse, but on that I do not agree, but that's a topic for another lecture. Blue collar work cannot yet be despecialized, despecialized as effectively as white collar work, but that's not too far away in the future either. Fully automated robotic fabrication is already current in some industries. And in design schools, as you know, we are actually quite good at it. Robotic factories are mostly immune, immune to economies of scale. They do not need to scale up to break even, and they can be located closer to their markets, reducing the global transportation of raw materials and of mass-produced goods and components. 
anecdotally, but meaningfully, right at the start of the pandemic, some of my friends and colleagues like Manuel Garcia de Barter or Jenny Sabin at Cornell, who I think you will soon meet or you have just recently met, they started to convert their 3D printers and robotic arms to produce PPE protective equipment for medics and hospital workers. And they did so on site, on specs and on demand. The Fab Lab in this case was located five miles from the hospital, which needed this stuff. So they didn't need an airplane for delivery. They delivered this by bicycle. Because this is indeed the point. This is what robotic fabrication was always meant to do. The same robotic arm like this one, but made that Zaha did table set last week can make shield for medical staff today in close proximity from a hospital in need. Once again, the emergency of the pandemic has proven a long held theoretical assumption of digital design theory. The next wave of robotic fabrication will not automate the industrial factory, that's already done. And we shall need less and less of that. The new generation of robotic fabrication will eliminate the industrial factory and replace it with a network of smarter, nimbler, reprogrammable micro factories, flexible installations that will make things when needed, where needed, as needed using local material, locally produced energy, and the global electronic network of data and computing power. The next wave of automation will not replace industrial workers. It will reinvent the pre-industrial artisan and its inherently sustainable circular economy. Now, if this may look a bit too optimistic, I know full well, and I am the first to admit and to regret, that many things have gone wrong in the way we approach computational tools and even digital culture in general in the course of the last 30 years. Digital theory has been infiltrated by a number of malevolent ideologies. And I do not only mean right-wing libertarianism, the political ideology of choice for many venture capitalists that invested in, in, invested in promoted and profited from digital technologies. That's an easy target, but it's only the tip of the iceberg. More generally speaking, and in my opinion, more meaningfully, the ideology of the so-called postmodern science of complexity has by now deeply pervaded contemporary computer science offering a conceptual framework driven by the belief in the supernatural power of emergence and self-organization by the search for the irrational leap in the dark, the drastic and sudden reset, the creative quantum leap, almost a religion inspired by a morbid fascination for the palingenetic power of the catastrophe. When this theory is applied to evolutionary algorithm, when it's mathematics, that's probably okay. And that, by the way, was John Holland's original idea in the 70s. But when this theory is extended from technical system to social system, or even to politics, well, in my opinion, that is not such a good idea, but this would be the topic for another talk. So let me just restate here briefly where we stand now. The pandemic has proven that if we sympathize with the post-human biopolitics of the germs and we let germs free to self-organize, germs will do what germs typically do. They will kill millions. Just like recent political events have proven that there is still a difference between democracy and totalitarianism. And if we sympathize with the post-modern identity politics of nation states, and we let the nationalists free to self-organize, they will kill millions too. The pandemic and for the last few weeks war in Europe have brutally reminded us that reality exists even without interpretation. There is still a difference between fact and fiction, evidence and trial, reason and belief, science and voodoo, life and death. 
The pandemic and the war have proven that a complex project for the self-organizing universe of emerging vitalities is a sure recipe for catastrophe. And they have also proven that catastrophes, contrary to the principle of postmodern system theory, while catastrophes tend to be unpleasant for those who find themselves in the middle of them. The pandemic and the war are unexpected, an unexpected and unwelcome revival of the real. They remind us that non-human entities, such as objects or germs, left to themselves are not necessarily our best friends. The jungle left to itself is likely not the friendlier place for humans to live. We do not need object-oriented ontologies these days. We need socially oriented computing. We urgently need a neo-modern, new rationalist, a new digital agenda for a truly post-industrial world. What the pandemic has proven by temporarily and catastrophically obliterating every alternative is that this agenda exists. This alternative is viable. I just wish we should not have made a global catastrophe to prove that we were right from the start. Back in the 90s, we claimed that industrial modernity was doomed and that post-industrial automation and computation were the only alternative. After 2001, that quickly became a lost cause, often an unpopular one. Today, post-industrial computation is no longer a choice, it's, it's our only remaining choice. There is no point in claiming that industrial modernity is unsustainable because industrial modernity is literally unsustained, having already imploded in full. There is no point in claiming that post-industrial computation is our future because we may not have noticed it, but for the last two years, post-industrial computation has been our present. And as it happens, we in the design professions, we have a few ideas on how we could make post-industrial automation and computation work. One generation ago, we were among the first to conceptualize and theorize computational post-modernity. We were among the first to try to work with it, to try to make it work, first at small scale, then full size. One generation later, we're still among the best in that trade. Today, all the digital and computational experiments we have been testing and trying for the last 30 years, from cyberspace to e-learning, from virtual reality, augmented reality, to digital mass customization, micro factories, distributed robotic automation, all of these ideas are primed and ready to go mainstream. In many ways, many of these computational tools have already gone mainstream because for the last two years, they have been indispensable because during the COVID crisis, we were obliged to use them. And in the process, we learned how to use them. And we now know that if used soberly and advisedly, some computational tool for communication and for production and fabrication can actually work. So let's try at least to learn something from the still ongoing catastrophe. This is not the time to repair and relaunch the Anthropocene. It's the time to invent a viable computational alternative to industrial modernity. And we know how to do it because we have been prepping for quite a long time. And this is my last word for the day. Thank you for your patience. And Thank now, you so much. Yeah. I will drink a glass of water if you give me a couple of minutes and then I come back for a round table discussion if that's, if that's what you have in mind. Yes, okay? yes. Give me two minutes, I'll of be right course. back. Thank you so much, Mario. Um, and he made it, he made it through his lecture despite a cold uh, very, very well. <laughs> so as he gets a drink, I will just uh, invite uh, Lydia to, uh, or I'll tee it up for you, Lydia, to, to uh, begin your moderation session with your students. Thank you. Perfect. So let's wait for uh, Mario because it feels weird to, you know, talk about things without him. 
and it's not right. So let's wait for him and then, yeah, I'm happy to take over. Maybe as a way to start, Lydia, if you uh, could speak a little bit about your class and what the students are studying. Sure, I was planning to do that, but it would be good for, oh, him, for to, him to hear, <laughs> to hear no, that. <laughs> That's why I know it's awkward. And yeah, I could say it all, but it would be good for him to sort of set it up. I understand. But yeah, I hope that the students, you know, see yeah. clear connections between what we do in class and and the lecture so yeah good incidentally i hope that uh you will have an opportunity to resume your practice in good weather of taking your class outdoors i appreciated seeing you in the past do that yes this is we i mean in this seminar we managed to do it just once because there's always something rain or whatever but i hope that we are back but we recently started started doing picnics indoors so you know we bring cheeses and fruits and you know the students are doing it not just me so yeah so we we are trying to make um, this experience pleasant besides learning back. perfect <laughs> perfect should i close the screen sure and we go back to um uh, stop share screen. Yeah, here we go. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, I put something on my throat, so I probably managed to speak for 30 more minutes. <laughs> fingers. Great, that sounds promising. I feel you, I have a cold as well, so it's it's tough out there, I know. Okay, so thank you so much for this wonderful talk. And there are many things obviously to unpack, but I want to make sure that our students have a chance to ask questions. So I will let them talk before I get a chance, if I get a chance to, to talk with you about some things. Um, I would like to briefly introduce our uh, student panel today. So we have eight students who all take my seminar on architecture and production that I'm teaching this semester. And just so you know, this class or focus group, as you uh, renamed it, um, we examine different methods of architectural production and their social, economic, and political consequences. So your talk is very much related to what we analyze in class. Um, the students are also familiar with the readings you sent um, to ask before your talk and their questions relate to them in a more or less direct way, but also uh, probably they might, I mean, probably they will slash they might have some other new questions after your um, talk. So let me, um, maybe let's start with Nathan and let's just, uh, yeah, start our panel. Okay, I right, listen. All right. So, uh Nathan, would you like to go first? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you for your talk, Professor. Um, so given where uh, architecture currently stands regarding algorithmic design or, or parametric design or even automated design um, as being nearly standard practice, do you deem aging or practically obsolete methods of design uh, worth preserving? Or uh, in other words, has architecture lost some quality that should be preserved, but that has no place within the new paradigm. Um, is that your query, Nathan? Are you done? I'm sorry? Is that your question? Yes. Uh, good, because I lost a few words. Um, well, evidently, the number of things we do is limited. So where a new technology comes in, it always to some extent replaces something which we used to do with the pre-existing technology. But also every new technology allows us to do stuff which we could not have done without it. So generally speaking in the classes I teach, um, actually in every class I teach, I always start with a first introduction which I never published, so you will not find it anywhere called ways of making, which I understand is vaguely related to the topic of your class, modes of production. And so I generally explain that 
in the general hyper general universal scheme of things there are only three ways of making hand making which is craft mechanical machine making which came with the industrial revolution and digital making which is what has been evolving for the last 30 years and i need to explain this threefold partition to make it clear that the digital is not an extension of the mechanical age. This is a common misunderstanding. Computers are machines, robots are machine, so the industrial evolution is continuing. Yes and no, because digital tools are machines, but they are a new kind of machine, which is in many ways closer to the pre-industrial way of making than to the industrial way of making, which is why you have to explain that Industrial meaning craft is based on the variability of the human gesture and everything we make by hand is always different. Mechanical industrial mass production is determined by the pursuit of economy of scale and mass production obtained through standardization. And the digital is all about digital mass customization, which is about, well, it's a long story. But to go back to the Nathan original question, in the world where we live, if you just look around you, look at the room where you are or what you see out of your window, you will see that there are still many things which are made by hand, even 250 years after the onset of industrialization. So chances are that 250 years after the onset of the digital revolution, some things will still be mass produced in the modern mechanical industrial way. Um, so there will still be something which we need to make by hand. There will still be many things that we will still have an advantage in mass producing in the industrial way, but there will be things which will be moved to the new technical age of digital mass customization. So instead of having to choose between craft and industries, which is what the postmoderns had to do in the 70s. You don't like modern factories, then the only alternative is craft. Today, we have an option. If you don't like a modern factory, you can fall backward on making by hand, or you can leap forward toward digital mass customization. We have one additional option, which simply means that, in my opinion, the three ways of making will still coexist. This applies to everything we do, to everything we make, including the notations upon which much of the, of the architectural profession is predicated. So do you think that computers will completely eliminate hand drawing and water colors? No, there are cases where hand drawing and water colors will still be valuable and probably inevitable. There will still be a few cases when the blueprint of the 1930s will probably still be used. I don't see many chances of that happening because, um, but even in that case, I think that the three ways of making, making by hand, making by industrial tools and making by digital tools will keep competing. And it will be left to our choice as intelligent designers to choose for each assignment, the medium which is more suitable. And in many cases, it may still be craft and in some cases, it may still be industrial. But bear in mind that in some cases, now we have an additional option, which 30 years ago or 40 years ago, when I was a student, didn't even exist. This is an advantage that you guys have, and I didn't have when I was in your age bracket, so to speak. So I think it's good for you. I'm wondering, you know, before I can't resist the temptation to ask something, you know, before we move forward, um, like, don't you think that this uh, demand for um, traditional or traditionally made objects will be dictated by, well, social and economic factors that it would potentially contribute to, you know, the divide between people who can afford good design and people who simply cannot and are just, you know, and, and need to use whatever mainstream design production uh, there is, be, it, ro be it, it's robotic or anything else. And if that's the case, then, you know, that's potentially a big social issue, right? And politically you know, as well. Craft, craft is expensive and craft will be more and more expensive only the 1% or probably even less can afford to pay for handmade boots or handmade shirts, which is, you know, 
Prince Charles in England, everything he wears is handmade because this is what billionaires do. Everything is made by hand, made bespoke, made to measure. The same applies to uh, building. But that was the original argument of modernism. That was the principle, Le Corbusier claimed, why is housing so expensive? Because housing is still handmade as if it were, as if it were pure craft. Whereas the Americans have industrialized the making of automobiles. Why should we not build standardized, industrialized houses just in the way a sport is standardizing and mass producing the automobile? The automobile used to be made by hand. It was expensive. Then Ford came, standardized the car, made it always the same, the same for all. Achieves economy of scale. Now the workers at the moving assembly line of a Ford factory can buy the car they make because it costs three months of their salary. That was in 1921 or something like that. So the Corbusier argument was evident. Why should we not do with housing what the Americans have done with the automobile? So housing will be affordable and people will have, but of course, if you want to play that game, you have to standardize housing. You have to prefabricate it because that's the only way to achieve economies of scale in a modern industrial technical environment. We have been trying to do that for almost 100 years. And as we know, prefabrication in most cases when applied to housing doesn't really work. It was tried in some countries, was more successful. In some countries, was less successful. In some countries, wasn't even ever tried. But now we know that there were limits to how much, if you want to standardize the making of a parking lot, we know how to do it. If you want to standardize the making of social housing, it, it, we tried and it, it doesn't work. Now, with digital technologies, the argument is we can, we are no longer obliged to standardize what we make in order to achieve economy of scale. Because with digital mass customization, we can mass produce variations of the same unit cost. So we are no longer obliged to make everything always the same, to make it cheaper. We can make it cheaper and still customize it, which in the case of housing, it is an asset. Because the idea that everyone should have exactly the same house is an idea that many dislike on ideological grounds. And some like on ideological grounds, but that becomes, of course, ideology. Now, the point is, if you want to make housing and make them different, you don't necessarily have to make them more expensive because with today's technologies, you can bring some degree of variability into a digital design to production workflow. So this is what we can do. And the Corbusier couldn't even conceptualize because his dream was to standardize, to mass produce, you have to standardize. That's the way to make housing cheaper. Today, we can make housing cheaper without necessarily having to make housing always the same and the same for all. This is, a, in a sense, a postmodern project or dream came through. We are not quite there yet, and we may never be there practically, but it's good to keep this conceptual framework in mind because this is the way digital technologies were always meant to work, except that market forces, ideology, prejudice and uh, our you know, resistance to change still oblige, in a sense, us to use digital technologies, not to do what we could do with them, but to imitate what we could have done without them, which is what happens every time that technological change make us a little bit restless and worried. But this happens every time. But yes, there is at the bottom of a shift or rift between craft and machine made industrial or post industrial, there is a factor of cost. Craft is expensive and it will be more and more expensive. It will be, which is why it is a niche area of production. Only the very wealthy will keep, will keep uh, you know, being paying for it. But think of many areas where digital mass customization is not a matter of choice, it is a matter of necessity. Think of one domain with these technologies have already been implemented to full potential. Um, surgical replacement, knee replacement, or even dentistry. Um, 
If you need a knee or a hip for a knee replacement or a hip replacement, you cannot standardize it. You cannot mass produce and put the same knee on everyone because everything needs to be different. So in that case, the fact that using digital technology can scan a knee and 3D print a new knee exactly in the shape you need on time, on spec, on demand, on site, dentists are already doing that instead of doing the old way of making an imprint of the tooth and then sending to a lab. And then in Europe in recent times, since they outsourced, for example, my Paris dentist had the replacement of the crowns, he made the mold, that was 15 years ago, he made the molds in his cabinet in central Paris, then FedEx it to a dentist in Belgrade, Serbia, to have it made locally and shipped back by FedEx to Paris because was better done and cheaper. Now, today he can do that in his cabinet with a 3D printer. This one case with digital mass customization has already changed the life of many people because this technology now makes this kind of surgery affordable. I don't claim that housing needs to be as customized as a knee replacement, but I mean, the argument deserves to be made. Right, thank you. You know, my question really boiled down to this um, issue of socially oriented computing, which you mentioned, and I find it the most maybe problematic because, you know, this is, I mean, we want this, but we, I don't think that we yet have a clear idea how exactly this would work. And it's good that you mentioned this, uh, you know, example of 3D printing also because this is in a way, I mean, you don't need to convince anyone i think here especially about you know benefits of 3d printing but we also are aware of the well downsides of it like you mentioned you know okay 3d printing of medical equipment this is what's happening in places like palestine where they cannot have where they don't have access to regular medical equipment very often so they are trying to you know manufacture um cheaply and easily um medical parts that they need. But the problem is that very often they don't function as well because, you know, like with architecture, it needs to be well licensed. There's a process of vetting for a reason. Um, with medical equipment, this is obvious. This is why we couldn't use ventilators, 3D printers when we needed them. And we needed to, for, you know, like big um, suppliers to catch up on demand during COVID, right? So. I'm just saying that there is a significant risk uh, that I don't know if we yet, you know, figured it out how to basically, as you said, you know, it will always be the case that craft and, and these unique objects will be for people who can afford them. And that's, that's just simply how it is. But great success and promise of uh, robotic or, uh, well, okay, let's say robotics in design would be that it wouldn't be a necessity, but a matter of choice, you know, that wealthy people, it would work so well that wealthy people would uh, choose this as the, you know, technology of choice, and it wouldn't be the last resort for, for less fortunate, right? And this, I just, I'm wondering if you have ideas on how to make this work socially. Well, why do you want to oblige wealthy people to choose a good technology? Wealthy people tend to be dumb. So let them choose a bad technology. If that pleases them, if they want to waste their money to have something made by hand in a way which is probably underperforming, if that pleases them to squander their money that way, that's none of my business. I really don't care about them. A friend of mine, whom I shall not mention, recently um, was invited to display a technical start startup in a big festival in London, um, proving new technologies for the future of post-Brexit England or something like that. And it was showing robotic, um, a, a robotic micro factory. And the only thing that they are producing for the moment is you know, a startup, it's um, garden pavilions, prefabricated with robotic assembly, et cetera, et cetera. It's almost a proof of concept, meaning they want to test it at this scale to have a proof of, you know, we know the concept, we need an economic proof. But for some reason, his robot and uh, was shown in this festival and the prime minister, Boris Johnson, visited. And he was very intrigued by seeing these robots assembling the pieces of a timber 
a garden pavilion and he had a conversation which my friend related to me and it is not recorded off the microphone and so the prime minister said this is this is so interesting and so promising for the future of this country but tell me could you use it to make more traditional forms something that looks good <laughs> you see the problem so these people will only i mean you, you cannot change the mind of idiots let, let, let them let them let them waste um, if they want to have something made by hand because it pleases them well we could chop off their head which is what revolution often did i would be happy to let them spend their money by doing that but at some point the stuff we do technically will be vastly superior in purely technical terms meaning in the, in the case of surgery it is already the case that automation is more precise but the best paid surgeon in manhattan so if you still want the human touch go for it but be aware that the robot is probably going to be better some people will always like the human touch it's not my cup of tea i don't care well sometimes it's indispensable as, as i said there is stuff we will always need to make by hand okay we have to deal with that but people who want to have something made by hand because it's an ideological choice that's no longer my problem as an architectural theoretician this is a social a form of is a social part in a sense it's, it's not an architectural problem it's a political problem okay thank you i could you know go forward yeah, no, no, with no, that no. but i want because again it's for the students not for my pleasure uh, so let's move to masume shall we uh, would you like to take it from there masume sure um first thank of all thanks for a great talk um so one of the risks of technologies for non-standard production is that they may expand the offer of commodities beyond necessity and uh, create even more artificial demand and boost consumption even more. So my question is that um, how to avoid this risk or uh, what is the solution for that? I missed a few words in your question. Since you have it in writing, can you read it again? Thank you. <laughs> sure. Uh, so uh, one of the risks of technologies for non-standard production is that they may expand the offer um, of commodities beyond necessity and create even more artificial demand. Got it. This is the part I had missed. You don't, the rest I've heard it. <laughs> yes, yes. It's a very good point. It is a, a, a frequent objection to the use of digital technologies. By multiplying choice, you are in fact creating, an, you are inflating demand. So you are encouraging waste. That is indeed the case. Um, digital mass customization um, enables everyone to customize a product which doesn't need to be customized, hence would create a demand which has no need to be there. A typical example, which is often quoted by Bernard Cash in this kind of discussion is, he, also, he always has a big ballpoint pen in his hand, just like the one I'm holding today. This is an industrial product. It was designed by Baron Bisch, um, stealing the technology invented by a Hungarian called Laszlo Biro, and he founded the French company Big, which to this day make this ballpoint pen in one million, billion, trillion identical copies sold around the world. And it is cheap because it is mass produced. Um, now, using a 3D printer, I could download a file and customize this ballpoint pen and make my big pen different from yours. And each one of us could have a different big pen, which, however, would write just the same. This is a typical example of cosmetic mass customization. You customize something which you don't need. This is waste. This is an example of what we can do and some stupid people actually do, but what reasonable people and as architects, we have a duty to advise and to have suggestions. This, this is something that you shouldn't do because no matter if you could put a, the, you know, the nose of Donald Duck on the top of this big pen, it would still write like a big pen. And so this example, uh, this illustrates the case you were making. Some people, uh, you know, 
digital mass customization, we call it digital mass customization to distinguish it from another concept, which is just mass customization, which was invented in the 80s um, as a marketing device. It was invented by a business school, I forgot which one. The idea was that through multiple choice, the multiplication of supply will increase an artificial demand, exactly as you were saying. It's a, a, a trick, a marketing trick. You sell the same product in seven or eight apparently different, but in fact identical units. So people who normally would have used one, they will get tired and when we buy another one that they don't need it, et cetera, et cetera. That's a, a marketing trick. Digital mass customization is not a marketing trick. It is a technical logic, which allows us to make things different at no supplemental cost. You may, we may still be, you know, stupid and use this technology badly. It always happens and it will keep happening. But if we are, if we are smart, this is what we should not do. Yes, the risk is inherent in the technology and it's good that you, you know, flag the issue because it will always be the case. Good point. Do we have uh, time for, yeah, we should have yeah. time for like a couple more. Um, so maybe Eric, would you like to ask your question? Hello? Yes, we can hear <laughs> Sorry, you, we can see internet. you, but we, we can't okay. hear you. <laughs> yeah, I'm having internet connection issues. Um, but maybe going off that same idea of like inherent disposability in um, digital mass customization, I was wondering if um, uh, theoretical revolutionary potential or are they kind of destined to fall into capitalist logics of We missed him. We lost him. We lost him, but you know, he did. We did talk about these questions beforehand. So I actually know what he was planning. <laughs> I know better than Eric, you know, I just say I, I can be him. <laughs> uh, so um, as far as I remember, Eric wanted to ask if um, these, you know, <coughs> I'm sorry. I'm not the only one to be running out of. Yes, as I mentioned, it's somehow it's contagious, you know, online. It, it doesn't travel on the internet. If you get the, <laughs> it's a germ, it must be local. Okay, good mine. to know. Good to know. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Now she froze too. If these, you know, endless design possibilities. <laughs> oh, sorry. I, now, I, now I lost you, but I think we're good. Okay, excellent. Uh, so Eric was wondering if these endless design possibilities can have revolutionary potential or are they just doomed to fall into this capitalist logic of uh, consumption or neoliberal, you know, framework of uh, consumption and economy? Well, Is there this... any hope for revolutionary <laughs> potential? In... Not in the technology as such. This is, of course, also a question which is well put and often and always pertinent, but what we are trying to understand is the technical logic of a tool. And this tool can be used in many different ways. This is the technical logic of the post-Taylorist, post-industrial world. The iconic technical logic of the world we are trying to replace is the moving assembly line. And consider the technical logic, the spirit of the moving assembly line invented in America around 1911-1913. In the course of the 20th century, every social system around the world has adopted that technology. Ford's moving assembly line has been adopted in the course of the 20th century by America. It has been adopted in Europe by totalitarianism. And Mussolini was enthusiastic about fiat moving assembly line. And so was Hitler when Volkswagen adopted them. But in the 30s, France adopted them. Um, even under the Front Populaire, um, liberal uh, colonial England did so. And in the course of it went, and then of course, importantly, the Soviet Union adopted the moving assembly line, Lenin and Stalin alike. 
what changed was the ownership of the factory, but not the machinery which was put into the factory. What we are trying to understand here is the technical logic of a new tool. And just as the moving assembly line in the course of the 20th century was used and adopted and exploited by liberal, by capitalists, by socialists, by social democrats, by communists and by socialists, and by fascists and by Nazis, they all adopted it. The factory, the machine, the technical logic inside the factory was always the same. What changed was the ownership of the factory, hence the extraction of the plus value, as Karl Marx would have said, and the distribution of profit, which was evidently different in the Soviet Union from where it was elsewhere. But inside the factory, you found the same machine. And technologists in all these countries were trying to interpret the technical logic of the tool, which technically worked the same, no matter who owned the factory and how the profit of the factory were shared among shareholders, workers, states, whatever. Robotics is the same game in a sense. So don't ask in this, if this is what interests you, don't ask what robots do, ask who owns the robot? Because that's the important thing to understand where and how the profits generated by robotic technologies will be shared or not shared. It's the ownership of the machine which determines that, not its technical logic. The robots will keep doing the same thing no matter who owns the machine, to some extent. Then, of course, in extreme cases, the technical logic can be perverted and tweaked. But generally speaking, in 90% of the cases, the robot is indifferent to the ownership of the land upon which the robot is positioned. Just as the moving assembly line was indifferent to the ownership of the land upon which the factory had been built. Witness the history of the 20th century. So ask who owns the robot, not what the robot does. And then you will find that depending on who owns the robots, uh, things can happen in different ways, including revolutions, if you like. Thank you. Do we have time for one more or? Let's take a, a last one. Perfect. Thank you. OK, so Meg, would you like to ask your question? I would. Um, first of all, thank you so much for lecturing today. I really enjoyed it. Um, and also for sharing um, your writings with us, not all of which are out right now. Um, so I, previous to your lecture, or. Um, in preparation, I should say, for your lecture, um, reviewed your post-type digital architecture writing um, from the irrational exuberance to irrational despondency. Um, and I kind of wanted to address your claim that digital technologies completely alter both the process of design and production, as well as changing you know, the way information is shared, which then, as you say, dictates um, so, so a different kind of social interaction in physical space. Uh, so being a part of the internet generation and also experiencing now a little over two years of college during the pandemic, um, I can testify that these claims are true. And so my question uh, kind of is, uh, what do you believe is the role of architecture in shifting from traditional spatial uses to meet now this digital age and its distinct spatial um, and social relationships? Um, you mean not the way we use technologies to design and to fabricate, but how technological change is going to sh change the shape of cities eh, or the shape of spaces we use? Is this where your question is going? Yes. Um, well, Bill Mitchell, uh, and that article you mentioned, I wrote it more than 20 years ago. So it is already a chapter in history. Um, <laughs> and I was, already reacting to that book by Bill Mitchell. I didn't know, of course, in 2001 or 2002 when I wrote it, what would happen in the 20 years that would, that would follow. Um, but Bill Mitchell had already anticipated that the migration of many activity from physical space to cyberspace would simply make the modern industrial city obsolete. But what is going to have uh, what has been, in a sense, proven by the pandemic in the last two years is not so much how that will change the position or the function of the factories, 
from the mega factory to the micro factory. This is a story which is interesting by itself, but I don't know if that is your experience, but I live for the last two years, most of it in London, next to a business capital where for the last two years, there have been no business people. So uh, the city of London has been deserted. Nobody, these skyscrapers, the same as in Midtown Manhattan to some extent. They are still there. I could see them from the windows of my, of my living room, all the lights on. And the only people I've seen inside these skyscrapers with the name of prestigious financial firms, banking, insurance, et cetera, et cetera, were maintenance crew and people keeping the lights on and cleaning the windows. But for 18 months, nobody was doing any work in any of these buildings. And now, <laughs> They say that the pandemic is over and some are bringing office workers back to the office and some are starting to calculate and they say, but wait, for the last two years, business went on as usual. It was business as usual. The stock exchange never shut down. The insurance market never lost a minute. All retail banking, et cetera, et cetera, kept functioning just the same. And yet all these offices, all our offices, all our headquarters were empty. So someone is starting to make calculations and say, do we need all these headquarters? Do we need to bring all these workers to commute every day, to come from wherever they live five days a week, taking the tube, taking the train or whatever, or the car. And so when people realize that there are not many advantages on reporting to work seven hours a day, five days a week. Huge cataclysmic changes, even in the real estate market, will start to happen because people will realize that we need bigger houses and smaller offices. So if you own an office, you lose money. If you own houses, you earn money, just you know, the logic of, of the market. And this is just an example where it, will, it means, for example, that building a new train line to bring more commuters to a business center is nonsense. What they should do is build better fiber optic connection to the suburbs where these people have been working for the last two years without having to report to work, sometimes being upset because the internet connection was not good enough. So the solution is instead of building a new tube line or a new underground line or a new train line or a new bus line, build a new fiber optic line to bring better stable internet to places where people can work without having to physically commute. Is the point of the electronic transmission of data is cheaper and faster and more environmentally sustainable than the mechanical transportation of people and goods. But vested interests are against that. Why? Because downtown there are Starbucks and pubs and restaurants, which they need people to go to the office. So they drink coffee three times in the morning and twice in the afternoon, et cetera, et cetera. The entire business model of our cities is predicated on the commuter. So the, without being you know, a visionary or a utopian, if you're just a Philistine bookkeeper and you calculate the cost and benefits, it is evident that some things will have to change because we have evidence now that it doesn't make sense to keep the city as we have inherited it from the early 20th century. This modernist city, where there is a skyscraper where you work, but where you do not live. A suburb, the leafy suburb, where you live, but where you cannot work. And where you get bored, because there are no movies. You can do no shopping. If you want to go to the movies, you have to go to another place where there are only movie theaters, but uh, you cannot live there, you cannot work. This idea of a permanent circulation of people and goods due to the specialization of the city or even of entire territories. There are places where we can only do a certain thing and places where you cannot do. This is going to be reversed. And it is not a new invention. It is a revival. 
because the pre-industrial city was always based on the promiscuity and mixity and proximity of people and activities, of different activities. In a medieval city, uh, in the typical house of a merchant, you had the warehouse in the basement, the shop in the courtyard, the store on the front, the back office, it was the back office, it was inside the, the artisan lived on the first floor. His apprentices lived in the garret, all under the same roof. Nobody traveled anywhere because everything happened <laughs> at the same time in the same place. And of course, during the Industrial Revolution, we had to separate these activities to achieve economies of scale. So a shop must be close to other shops. Retail must be in a retail area because we have transportation. It made economic sense based on the technology of the 19th century. It doesn't make sense anymore based on today's technology. This is what architects are somewhat resistant to conceptualize because it goes to some extent against our best interest. We like building skyscrapers, of course, who doesn't? But the point is we shouldn't be skyscraper for offices because uh, we shall need fewer and fewer of them. There is a slogan I heard recently here in Manhattan from boardroom to bedroom, conversion of a black office tower, the boardroom is at the top. Now the boardroom is converted to a bedroom because the entire high rise office building is converted into residential. It's already happening in Manhattan, not in London. Hmm. Time will tell. From boardroom to bedroom. Let's reconvene in 10 years and see if that happened. Thank you so much. If, you know, I wish I were Dean Stern and have you all over for drinks or for me and Mario tea and lemon and honey because we're sick. Uh, but anyway, so we could all ask our questions and discuss further, but I'm afraid we need to end. So I'm handing it over to Blaine. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, uh, Mario, thank you so much for, for your uh, vocal endurance. Uh, <laughs> During, during your cold as well. Uh, I, I, did, I did take a booster between the two sessions to, to make my voice. <laughs> Good. Uh, I second Lydia's uh, comments. I, I feel like we've all been able to really enjoy and participate in a kind of seminar with you today. And it's it's been intellectually stimulating and, and refreshing despite uh, your cold and, and Lydia's cold and, and our physical distance. Uh, but just in closing, uh, as a way to, to share some thoughts that I, I had during your talk and the discussion. And I appreciated that you started with Marshall McLuhan as a reminder uh, of, of the beginning of what's been uh, a substantive and yet very fairly uh, accelerated journey into, into these digital turns. Uh, and I was thinking about um, uh, McLuhan's statement about fish. And the fact that one thing that about, about which fish know exactly nothing is water because it defines their existence. And it's, it's not, they don't know about this sort of anti-environment to water as he described it. And for me, I began to think about these digital technologies as becoming a kind of water for us about which we hadn't really questioned them as deeply uh, as we have done since the pandemic. Uh, and, the, and we're using water, so to speak, in some ways, much more frequently, right, with Zoom and other technologies. But I feel like this has been, uh, albeit a very difficult challenge for us, the pandemic, uh, an incredible opportunity for us, especially as architectural thinkers and architects, to consider the use of digital technologies and uh, the implications of atoms versus bits in both making and experience. And so I really appreciate your uh, really thoughtful prompts to uh, encourage all of us to think more deeply about these issues. Uh, Thank you. I didn't know this story of McLuhan on the fish. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know where, in which, in which McLuhan book? I, I will try. It might. Send, send me the quotation. I will send I will, it. If it's, it might I be an understanding it. media, but I'll try to, but maybe not. I'll, I'll find the source. Uh, That's but yeah, very but, valuable. Yeah. 
<laughs> Absolutely. But thank you so much, Mario. And, and we will host you sometime in person. Uh, Hopefully in uh, person. Uh, because yeah. after all we have said, it's still better to have coffee around the table altogether. <laughs> <laughs> yes, really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. And see yeah. you all, hopefully, around that coffee table at some point. <laughs> Absolutely. Hope you feel thank better you. soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you to Lydia and the students and Peter and Caddy for curating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone have a great weekend.